Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining our webinar. So I'm Masuma Ali, and I'm the engagement manager for the East of England, and I manage the Bedfordshire Site Loss Council. So this evening's webinar will be chaired by Hubert Powelkiewicz. But before I hand over to Hubert, I'll briefly like to mention to everybody on the webinar today about a sports and leisure toolkit that has recently been launched. So UK Coaching, in partnership with the Thomas Pockington Trust, has created a free toolkit for gym and leisure operators to support people with a visual impairment. So basically the toolkit has a range of resources and videos that leisure operators can use to train their staff to ensure that their facilities are accessible to blind and partially sighted people. So one of the things that we are doing is asking leisure operators to encourage all of their staff from reception staff to personal trainers to get engaged with the training and make sport accessible in their venues. To find out more, you can either visit the UK coaching website or Thomas Pulkington Trust's website to access the training. I'll now hand over to Hubert for the remainder of the webinar. Hubert, over to you. Thank you, Masuma. Welcome everyone to the second Bedfordshire Sadler's Council webinar. I'd like to first remind you all to keep your microphones muted so that uh, there'll be no distractions and we can all hear the speakers clearly. We also ask you to use the Q&A chat function built into Zoom to ask questions to our guest panel of speakers. The meeting is also being recorded and broadcast live on Facebook, so by participating, you agree to the above. So let me tell you first a little bit about the Sight Loss Councils. They are supported by Thomas Pocklington Trust. We currently have 13 Sight Loss Councils operating across the country, Bedfordshire being one of them. They are made up of blind and partially sighted people in various local areas and focus on working with organisations in order to ensure their services are accessible to the visually impaired community. And this is all done by collabor collaboratively working with the organisations and the blind and partially and the, the partially sighted community. Sight Loss Councils focuses on three priorities. They are employment skills, health and well-being, and inclusive community. The Sight Loss Councils meeting are run every month, and we are always looking for new active members. So if you are interested in joining, hopefully you can go to the Sight Loss Council website, which is sightlosscouncils.org.uk, and join your local Sight Loss Council. You should all have been emailed a copy of our program, and it is all focused, as mentioned above, on sports and leisure. Feedback from blind and partially sighted people has clearly identified that physical activity is very important, and especially it was highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic. The importance of physical activity on physical and mental health was frequently mentioned as a key during these times. So we've got people who are key leaders in the sports community, sporting industry across Bedfordshire to speak to you about various sporting opportunities available in the local area. Each speaker will speak for 10 minutes. And after that, there will be an opportunity for people to ask questions to the speakers. We also asked every person who has registered to provide a question for the panel. So we will look at these questions as well before we go to the questions in the chat. At the end, we will also have an inspirational talk by Roy Turnham, professional blind, blind footballer and tennis champion. So first of all, we would like to start with our first speakers, which will be Lisa Simpson, development office, leisure development officer at Central Bedfordshire Council and Steve Holton, Senior Countryside Officer, also at Central Bedfordshire Council. Over to you, Lisa and Steve. Hi, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, my name's Lisa. I'm the Leisure Development Officer for Central Bedfordshire Council. Um, 
So I'm going to be talking about roughly, I'm going to be sharing the time with Steve, my colleague uh, from Countryside. So um, I'll just speak for about five minutes. Um, I work a part of our contract team with our, our leisure sites. Um, and I've been doing some research with what we offer currently and our accessibility for those who are visually impaired. Um, we do do a lot of sort of, we have um, DDA reports annually. So we make sure they're up to standard um, and statutory requirements are all put in. So we have Braille on our lockers um, and some of our forms. Um, the staff are required to do some training, which incorporates um, different forms of disability, including um, party sighted. Um, so we have those within all of our centres. And I said that, as I mentioned, they're reviewed every year. We have specialised um, equipment. Um, we have procedures in place. So if somebody wanted to go, who was vision impaired, wanted to turn up to the leisure centre um, to do a class, a gym or a swim session, um, they can do that. There will be support there for them. Um, carers will be able to go in for free. So if you're being assisted with, by somebody, um, whether that's in the pool or in the gym, um, that assistant will be able to go in with you, uh, whether that be in the gym to help you against with different equipment or whether that be into, in, in the pool. Um, they will go in free. That's our concession policy um, under the carers uh, framework. Um, there is a sort of concession rate, which would be sort of through sort of GP um, concession rate as well. So they can use that on any classes, swims um, across the centres. Um, so that's available at the moment. Um, we're looking to do some specific activity. So if people can let us know what more we can do or anything that you'd like us to do, uh, whether that be practical sessions or you know more support or accessibility reasons, um, then please do let us know. We've got three new site projects coming up as well. So your feedback in that will um, will be valuable. So I'll just pass you over to Steve, my, my colleague from Countryside. Hello, and thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, it's, lovely, it's lovely to be with you all this evening. Um, as Lisa said, my name's Steve Holton, and I'm a senior countryside officer, as Hubert said earlier. Um, and so we look after ooh, approximately about 65 countryside sites across central Bedfordshire. And they vary from very well-known places that are very popular. So places like Dunstable Downs, Rockrushmere Country Park at Stockgrove, and they've got visitor centres, they've got facilities, um, and they're used, of course, by lots of people, lots of different, different people from different communities, different backgrounds. Um, and we, they're, both those sites, as all our other sites, are open pretty well, um, you know, all, all year round. Um, some of our sites are small, so there might be nature reserves, which, which are really there for their wildlife. Um, and they don't have so many facilities. They might only have a very small car park, some not, not even that. Um, so we've got we've got everything from woodlands, um, chalk downlands, scrublands, um, wildflower meadows, heathland. We've got a whole range of countryside for people to enjoy. Quite a few of those sites have um, um, car parks and ease and good access. We've also um, put in um, hard surfaces around some of our sites. For, for instance, Flitting Wood has got a hard surfaced circular path. So that enables people in wheelchairs or people a bit unsteady on their feet to um, access the woodland, see the lovely bluebells and the wild garlic in the springtime, um, and really just enjoy the site all year round. We're a very small team, but as a team, we're very um, much pro um, encouraging everyone really to visit our sites and enjoy the sights and sounds all year round. Um, and we've we've long been aware of, obviously, of blind and partially sighted people, are pro probably an, an important part of people who come to visit our sites. And we're very keen to welcome, you know, more and more people from, from, from those kinds of um, backgrounds. Um, as Lisa said, you know, we're we're engaging now with, with Masuma and and your local group and we're very keen to um to get your your views and opinions too so anything that you feel that we could do to help improve our sites um to make it easier for yourself then we'd be very keen to um 
to, to engage with, with the, the local group on that. Um, one of our sites, the Dunstable Downs, actually has a, a 3D map on it. I think it's got two or three actually, near the entrance to the, um, the visitor center. So you can actually, um, for those of you who have got, um, who are partially sighted or blind can actually um, use the map to find your way around the site and um, access some really lovely areas that you can visit. Um, we have done a few walks with um, blind and partially sighted people around our sites, partly to show them what what they can what they can hear, but also to um, to get feedback on how we can improve our sites um, for blind and partially sighted people, and of course a whole range of people with disabilities. So we, you know we, we're very keen, as I said, to engage with with that sector and to improve the experience for um, for people um, coming to visit. So I think Lisa, Lisa and I, we both look forward to, to getting some feedback from you. Um, something we're looking at doing this over this next year or two is to improve our um, engagement with people who maybe wouldn't normally visit a countryside site. So we're hoping to, to put together a program of activities and events, um, taking people around, listen to things like the wind in the trees and birds singing, um, you know, and, and get a real feel for our countryside, how lovely it is, how good it is for your um, your mental health and your well-being. Um, so we, we have that coming up. So, you know, please um, keep an eye on our website. Um, we're on Facebook as well. We have a countryside um, sites web um, Facebook page, which you can certainly um, please feel free to join and um, find out what's going on. And as I said, we're very keen also to work with yourselves to um, improve our our countryside sites um, for everyone. So we look forward to engaging with you both over this co this coming evening and also um, wider and um, into the future. Um, that's probably me for now. So I look forward to hearing to engaging further as we carry on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you to you, Steve, as well. That was very good. We'll welcome our next guest now, Kate Neal, co-event director at Luton Park Run. Over to you, Kate. Hello. Um, as Huber said, I'm Kate Neal. I'm co-event director at Luton Wardown Park Run. I'll try and stick to my 10 minutes. Um, so, which might be hard because once I've got started, <laughs> I can keep going. Um, I'm co-event event director at Luton Wardown Down Park Run. Um, I'm a member of Stopsy Striders, which is a running club in Luton. I'm an England Athletics running coach, um, mainly distance running, not sprinting, only sprinting. Um, I've also done the England Athletics guide running course, so that was a long time ago. I have guided a few people, um, but not that many, and I'd really like to change that. But what those things say about me on paper doesn't really say what my my real passion is which is um running and get, getting people involved in running particularly people who don't think they're runners or don't don't see themselves as runners don't think it's for them um and getting them to see actually they can be runners park run for those that don't know is, is now a worldwide phenomenon um, started nearly 18 years ago in, in the UK, and it's a free timed 5k run, jog, walk, um, held every Saturday in England at nine o'clock in parks and green spaces um, around the country. There are over 700 in the UK and over 2,000 in 22 countries around the world now. So it's a huge, huge phenomenon. But it's a very, very simple concept. Basically, you register once, um, you get your barcode, um, and with that, you can get a, a time. Um, but if you don't want, if you forget your barcode or you don't have a barcode, you can still come along and take part. Um, Loom War Down, is held in Wardown Park. Uh, and we've been going for nearly seven years now. Um, I mean, one thing that Park Run is, is really inclusive. 
we have people from four years old uh, up to our oldest one, oldest park runner is in his late 80s and he's there every single week. Um, so we've been going for nearly seven years apart from the last 18 month hiatus when we stopped. But we're on event about 278 and he has done over 100, 250 of those and he's in his late 80s. Um, although it's called park run, you don't have to run. We have runners, we have speedy fast runners um, who can do it in 17, 18 minutes, 5k, out of sight, nothing, nothing to do with me. Um, but we also, have, we, have we have walkers and we have people who will only walk and only want to walk and they will do it in an, an hour and 15, 16, 17 minutes and that's absolutely fine. Nobody ever comes last at Park Run because one of the volunteer roles is tail walker. So the tail walkers always come last. So nobody will ever come last. And we will stay out there as long as there are people out on the course with the tail runners coming in, at, tail walkers coming in at the end. Um, so between the speedy whippets and the walkers, we've got everybody in between. We've got people who run, people who run and walk, people who jog, people who hootle along chatting, that's usually me. Uh, we've got walkers. Um, you can, people can run with their dogs. Wouldn't necessarily recommend running with a guide dog, that could get interesting. Um, but if you want to get involved and you do have a guide dog, we can find a volunteer who will mind you, who will look after your guide dog whilst you're getting, but whilst you're involved in park run. Um, that happens at a number of park runs locally that I know of. Um, and I've now lost my train thought because I was talking thinking about guide dogs. Um, you can people can run with buggies. Um, so there are little kids involved until they, they get up to um, old enough to, to be involved. Um, you also don't have to get involved in running at all um, because park runs completely run by volunteers apart from about 20 or 30 at Park Run HQ who run the whole global world operation. Every park run is run completely by volunteers. Um, and so there are lots of volunteer roles to get involved with. It's basically, it's, I, I think, and I admit I am completely and utterly biased and I don't care, <laughs> but it is an amazing community. Um, it reflects the community within Luton. We now reflect the community within Luton really well, I think. Um, I don't think we have many disabled people involved, and I'd really, really like to change that. We've certainly got people who have done the guide running course who would like to be involved, but you don't need that guide running course bit of paper to be um, a decent guide runner as long as you've got a bit of common sense um, and are able to listen and able to communicate. Um, because each runner's got different needs and you just need to work out between you what works best, where, which side to stand on, what sort of tether, whether you want to tether, when you want to hold on, whatever. Um, and that's all very individual. So I don't think you, um, I know we've got people who are really interested in getting involved. Um, quickly, I'll say about stop to striders. I've lost track of what time I'm on. I don't think I've made 10 minutes yet, but I must be close. So stop to striders is a local running club um, based at Inspire in Stopsley in Luton. Again, very inclusive running club. Again, we've got the speedy whippets at the front that just disappear, but we've also got all sorts of other different um, timed groups groups who run at different times and we have a walking group as well. So we cover a whole range um, of running abilities, running and walking abilities. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in that, please come along. Um, so we meet in Spire Monday and Thursday and we have a track session at Stockwood. Again, there are people in, who are really keen to get involved as guides. Uh, we also run a beginner's course 
once a year. Obviously, we haven't run it for the past two years, so we're really keen to get it going again. And that's usually May, and it's usually 12 weeks, starting from completely nothing, right up to graduation at Parkrun um, after 12 weeks. Um, the last twice that we've run it, we've had started off with about 100 people each time, um, and we've got about 70 to 80 to the end of the course, which is pretty good, pretty good. Uh, and it boosts the numbers at Parkrun quite impressively. <laughs> Um, so if you're interested in that, um, you know, come along, find out. I will try and get, um, one thing I didn't say is there, if you're not Luton based, don't worry about it in relation to Parkrun. There are seven Parkruns in Bedfordshire and a few more in Hertfordshire that are quite close. Uh, and one in Rushmere Country Park, which although counts as Bedfordshire is apparently completely in Buckinghamshire. Um, but there's a park run there as well. Um, so I'll try and get the information about how to, about each park run and how to contact it to each park run and um, how to register. And also there's Dr. Strider's information as well. Um, and I really look forward to seeing as some of you come along. That's me, I think. I could go on, but I won't. Thank you for that, Kate. That was really good. Although running 5K in 17 minutes, that does sound terrifying. Yeah, yes, it's, I agree. It, yeah. But I'll introduce you to our next guest. It's Neil Frankel, Disability Tennis Manager at Riverside Tennis Club. Behind, he's behind the award-winning No Barriers Disability Tennis Programme. Thank you, Neil. Well, thanks, Hubert. And thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak to you all. And I uh, just wanted to say to start with that... Um, uh, say to Kate that I've done the park run in Bedford a few times and it's such an amazing community so even if you're like Kate says like not the fastest and you're not Hubert looking for a world record 17 minute run it's well worth a go so you should come down in fact Hubert I'm happy to come with you so we should we should make that make that a bet so um sounds good well it might might not be but we'll give it a go so um so yeah so um so as Hubert was saying my name is Neil Frankel and I am the disability tennis manager at Riverside Tennis Club in Bedford um, I started um, playing tennis when I was about nine years old, and that's quite a long time ago. Um, in fact, it's probably when it was all in black and white. So I started at lower school, and I remember particularly remember the a coach that came into lower school, and we did a little training session in the in this kind of lunch room there, and they used um, a bit of masking tape on the floor, and we got plastic rackets out and sponge balls, and we had a go at it, and I just absolutely loved it. So from the first session I've ever did, um, I was kind of really hooked on it. And I played quite a lot when I was a kid and I really enjoyed that. And I did a few tournaments and a few bits and pieces when I was growing up. And then I um, went through my rock and roll years and didn't play for a, for a couple of years when I was at university, just you know, doing other stuff, which I won't talk about online because that would be probably wrong. Um, and then I, when I got back um, after university, I really got back into it and I bumped into my old um, tennis coach um, at Riverside. So I grew up in Bedford and she just suggested you know while i'm i was finishing my studies and, and trying to work out what i wanted to do next in life that i should perhaps come down and help out and that was oh about 20 something years ago and really from then that is the only job that i've had so i'm really fortunate to be able to be a tennis coach i took my qualifications um probably in around about 1998 something like that um so i took a couple of qualifications to get my uh, coaching award and then i went on to do a few other qualifications in it and i've just been um, hitting tennis balls ever since which is which is absolutely great um we set up our no barriers program at the tennis club in about 2009 um, and it was really just a, a predecessing the 2012 the 2012 olympics in london and i don't know if you guys can remember back that far but it was a really big push uh, especially around the paralympics it was an amazing time uh, i think to be involved in sport and particularly in tennis um, and we got some funding from the LTA who is our kind of national governing body to put some put some money towards running some disability sport uh, and we were really uh, you know privileged and proud to do that and we set up this program called the no barriers program because we wanted to um, you know get people thinking about playing the sport where maybe previously there would have been a few obstacles in the way and particularly I think people with disabilities you know we wanted to break down those barriers and kind of you know kind of say what it was on the tin type thing and, and when we set up the program it was you know really new and, and we I think we had a couple of groups and I'm, I'm trying to think back Hubert you guys you and you started sort of quite early in that I think didn't you 2018 I believe 
Was it? All right. So you were, well, maybe a little late, late, late starter. But um, yeah, we've been going for a few years before that. And we were running sessions for players with LD and, and some uh, players with autism and, and working with children in wheelchairs as well, which was really good. Um, and then I sort of took over the role of, of the head of disability when I uh, made a major decision a couple of years ago to step back from kind of running all the coaching program. And I wanted to spend a bit more time sort of delivering lessons and working where I was really passionate. Um, so I sort of stepped down from doing a lot of the organization and the main part of the club and took on the role of disability tennis manager. And I absolutely love it. So I'm super privileged to do my job, even though I do get um, mercilessly, Hubert and Stefan mercilessly take the mickey out of me every Monday, um, which I can imagine you guys know Hubert quite well. It's probably quite, quite easy to imagine, but I can take it. Um, so uh, that's kind of me. Um, the sessions that we run at the club are at 10 o'clock on Mondays. And I'm sure like Kate was saying, you guys are all more than welcome to, to come and have a go and come and have a trial out. Um, so just a little bit about the history of uh, VI tennis or blind tennis as it used to be called, but we like to prefer to call it VI tennis. It was um, originally created in Japan by um, a man called Miyoshi Taeki and in 1984. So although tennis has been uh, you know, quite a, an old sport, I guess it's been around for a while, uh, the VI version of tennis is actually sort of relatively new. So the story goes that he, um, he, was, he was involved in some sports and he had a bit of a dream to, to get involved in tennis. And at that time, a lot of the, the VI sports were done in two dimensions. So for example, like table tennis was done on the table, but it wasn't over the net, it was just along the table. Um, that baseball was along the floor. So he wanted to uh, play his, his favorite sport, his tennis um, that he used to play when he was a child. And he wanted to do it in 3D. So he was talking to his teachers about how they could do that. And they spent years and years trying to um, develop the best ball, uh, or the best kind of chance to kind of pick up the ball in 3D. So not just along the, along the floor, he wanted to get it in the air. And they used all sorts of contraptions and bits and pieces to have a go at doing that. There's stories that they were using a kind of a, a toy plastic ball. They were putting little lead uh, marbles in balls and the ball wasn't really bouncing. Um, and after he graduated from school, he went to university and he, and he happened to chance, chance come across a physiotherapist who was working with some children with some sponge balls just to try and get some dexterity in their hands. And he had a bit of a brainwave and he said, well, look, why don't we use the sponge ball, which is quite soft and quite slow. And we'll put some a table tennis ball in with, with, uh, with some little lead, lead balls in and it will make a noise when it bounces. And although, as Hubert can testify, it's not the easiest thing in the world. It is a really nice way to kind of pick up where the ball is. Um, and that's kind of really, really where it sort of took on from there. Um, so one of the things uh, that, so after 1984, tennis, uh, VI tennis is now played in about 30 countries. So it's become quite popular, but what's kind of interesting, I suppose, for uh, the people that manufacture the balls, that all of the balls are still made in Japan. So the person who invented that first tennis ball is probably doing very well for himself in a huge mansion somewhere. But um, um, that's, that's kind of really interesting about the balls because lots of the other equipment is kind of made in different parts of the world, but all the balls are still made in Japan. So all the site classifications that we use in VI tennis are also super important because they ensure that we can get kind of fair and equal competition. And we always think that success should be defined by the ability rather than the, the impairment. So it's really important for us that, that we have a good categories when we do our sort of VI training. Um, and they also give confidence to people that they can start to, you know, play in, uh, against people with, with similar abilities as well. And there's um, five grades um, for VI tennis that, that currently use, and they're very sort of similar grades across sport, I think, in England. So we have a B1, a B2, B3, B4, and B5. And those with um, perhaps perhaps a little bit more sight are within the B2 to B5 category, and those maybe with a little bit less sight are in the B1 category. So if you're playing tennis at kind of a competitive standard, uh, B1 tennis is, is laid out as a slightly smaller court, and that's a little bit lower than you might normally expect to see on a kind of a, a Wimbledon. And like I said, the balls are those sort of soft balls, the spongy balls with the, with the sort of the, the lead noises or the, the little balls inside that, that you can sort of pick up where the ball bounces. And the outside of the court is marked with a line that's slightly raised so the, the players can feel the outside of the court with their feet and sometimes with their hands. Uh, for players that are playing um, tennis in the B2 to B5 category, um, slightly bigger court, the net's a little bit higher. It's the same ball, um, but there's no raised markings around the court. So it's kind of quite interesting, like, you know, how sometimes that, that, that's kind of pushed along and, and done. And we don't tend to use the raised markings um, at the tennis club because the times that we did do that, people kept falling over them. So that was not much fun. So we've decided to scrap that and we're just kind of really guiding people around um, the space that we use for that. Um, 
players in a B1 and B2 category are allowed to have three bounces. Although if you come and watch Hubert play, sometimes Hubert has about 18 bounces, but that's entirely okay. Uh, B3 players have two bounces and B4 and B5 have allowed one bounce. Um, and like I said, sometimes we um, we play some little points and we do some little matches around that. But but most of what we do at the tennis club is really based around sort of, of fun. If you start to get to quite a high level, uh, players in the B1 category are given a kind of Paralympic uh, recognised master. There's, there's absolute parity in all the players and there's, there's no one who's been able to have sneaky peaks and other people who are finding that a little bit, little bit more difficult. So that's kind of for what happens um, when you're playing at a sort of a higher level. But um, hopefully, as Hubert will testify, the, um, the sessions that we run at the club are essentially really good fun. So what we do in a, in a typical session uh, we were well, apart from the boys taking the mickey out of me for most of it and uh, not laughing at my jokes. Uh, we tend to do a bit of a warm up, uh, so that's a guided warm up, and we use the, the the net on the court as a as a bit of a way to kind of work out where we are on the court, and we run up and down up and down the net, and we'll do some different footwork exercises to kind of promote a bit of dexterity and a bit of movement, um, which I think is also really really important. And then we tend to go in, and Hubert won't know this, but I'm going to let you guys know it into a bit of a secret. Then we tend to go into a bit of a section, which is about what I call like receiving um, and giving. So really trying to get a bit of a sense of, of where I am in time and space and, and how maybe the ball might come to me and how I'm going to send that ball back to my either my partner, uh, my opponent or my partner. And then we'll get our rackets out and we'll have like a bit of fun about trying to do some different shots and practice some forehands and some backhands on one side of the body and then on the other side of the body. And then we've tried to hit upon um, trying to find some games that are like super engaging, that there's a bit of a winner and a loser, but it's quite good fun. And we tend to do a lot of games around sort of time so that everyone has an equal turn to have a go at maybe, I don't know, a certain challenge over two minutes, or we might have uh, an opportunity to sort of see how long does it take to get success for 10 types of shots or 20 types of shots. But the main thing is really for me is that it's a really great way for people to get connected. It's a great way to perhaps have a bit of a run around, get some, some fitness done. And it is just sort of super fun. So um, you are all more than welcome to come and try it out. Um, it's, you know, it'd be lovely to see you all. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Neil. Yes, can't comment on much Mickey taking. It's all done in good nature, honest. <laughs> so thank you very much to all our speakers. We will now move on to the question and answer session. So each at attendee to the webinar was asked to submit some questions. So we'll go through them before we visit the chat function. So the first question is for Lisa and Steve. What, if any, training do the staff receive at... Receive at Council leisure centres in regards to visual visual impairment awareness. Um, basically, they get sort of disability awareness, and within that is a section about visually impaired, um, and it's all all under one umbrella really in terms of equity and disability. Um, and and like I said, part of it is in that but we can have more training and and, and sort of do that. But they are trained, supposed to be trained every year, and um, that goes along with the DDA audit that we have as well. So they do, they do like reception staff, um, frontline staff, um, and managers get trained um, within sort of, you know, um, as I said, the general well-being, mental health and well-being, um, disability and sort of customer service. So yes, they should be um, all done, but we can make that more specific um, if, if needs be. Um, and I'm sure that we can get some advice off of those on the panel today um, about what can make it more specific um, and if there's specific areas that you want us to to train the staff in whether that be support or um, signage um, in terms of braille um, or accessibility then then do let us know um, and we can we can work with you on that I hope that answers your question yes thank you for that Lisa the next question is for Kate so the, this question is I like the sound of the, the, well, I like the idea of park run and being part of an inclusive community, but I can't run. Would it be possible for me to be paired up with a guide runner and start off slowly and possibly advance to qu quicker running in the mean, in time? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, definitely. Um, you don't have to run at all at Park Run. Uh, we do. We have walkers. We have lots of walkers who walk every week. Um, 
and I'm sure there are people out there who would be more than interested in in guiding um, and getting other people involved. So yes, definitely get in touch and we'll sort you out. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. Next question is to Neil. If I was to give tennis a go, will I be provided with equipment for me to take part in the session? Yeah, absolutely, Hubert. Um, we have uh, a whole multitude of rackets um, at the club, all different sizes, all different shapes. So yeah, we certainly loan those out. And what we've done over um, the last of 18 months is we've actually permanently lent all the players rackets so that they maybe feel a bit more confident that there's no one else going to be touching that and using that and, and, and picking it up during the week. So yeah, we've got tons of equipment, all the balls are provided, everything else you need is there. So yeah, come along. Thank you, Neil. And next question is to Kate, what level of training do the guide runners receive? Right. Not as much, possibly more training than I do for using the technology. Um, there is England Athletics do a guide running course, which is probably about half a day. Um, I've done it was sometimes it can be very difficult to get onto that course. Um, so I have done some sort of sessions as as a coach. I've done some sessions. Uh, where I've bor borrowed some simulation glasses and I've got people paired up um, and I've actually we did some stuff before park run and then I produced some blind got them into pairs produced some blindfolds um, and um, we had five pairs um, running park run um, and they swapped these were all sighted people and they swapped halfway through so they had um, turns guiding each other um, as I say, from my experience, it seems to be the best thing is somebody's got some com common sense and um, that their ability to communicate with people is good and their ability to listen. Um, I certainly, if I didn't trust somebody, if somebody was keen to guide, but I didn't particularly trust them, um, I wouldn't let them loose on anybody. <laughs> I, would pro I may get them to try and guide me or try and guide um, somebody with a sight uh, before I would let them loose on anybody else. So um, I don't know if that has answered the question or not. Yep, that's good. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, Lisa and Steve, the next question is for you. Will you be encouraging all the council-operated leisure centres to take advantage of the new lo newly launched sports kit released by UK Coaching and Thomas Pocklington Trust? Yes, is the answer to that one. I've, I've written that down as well. So I'm going to go back to our, our centres um, and encourage them to do that. And I think that'd be a really good good tool to have. And also trying to put some sort of sessions on as well, different activities that we can use within our sites. Again, whether that's a swimming session or a game session in, in, in the hall and think what we can do and what we can engage with. So yes, definitely is the answer to that question. Thank you, Lisa. Neil, the next question's for you. Do you offer a meet and greet at public transport spots near the tennis centre? Oh, that's a great question. Um, not at the moment, but, and it's a big but, there is a bus stop um, over the road from the tennis club, directly over the road. And we have previously picked up a few people um, uh, in that, from that position and sort of guided them into the club. Um, so if anyone, you know, feels that, you know, I know that it's sometimes quite difficult to go into a new space or a new, a new kind of uh, area. So if you do want to come along, don't let that be a barrier. We are more than happy to work something out. And I think because largely our groups are quite small, you know, we've got the ability to, to kind of tailor it to individual needs. Um, and the other thing, Hubert, I could ask you to just stay outside and you could pick them up. That'd be fine. You need to rely on me to guide people the right way. Mm. <laughs> You'll be fine here. But... Dangerous. Uh, Kate, <laughs> the next question's for you. What should I expect at my first park run? Ooh. Um, we meet in a group at the bandstand in Wardown Park. Um, and there is a briefing for first timers and people who are new to, um, to Luton park run because there are people who travel around the country um, doing different park runs so we have a, a first timers briefing um, and then there is a main briefing 
and then we will all walk down to the start together. Um, at the moment, we're getting between about 250, just under 300 people a week. So it's quite busy, not as busy as before COVID, but it's still quite busy. Um, there's a lot of chat, a lot, a lot of banter, um, a, a quite a lot of stuff going on. Um, your guide will get you into the right sort of position in the start line, in the start lineup, um, so that you're not going to get mown down by the speedy fast ones. Um, but, and um, and then there's usually a yell or a whistle, and off we go. Does that is does that answer the question? Yes, that's very good, Kate. Thank you. Uh, next question to Lisa and Steve. If I was to attend a leisure centre on my own, what level of support will I expect from the staff? Um, well, as I mentioned, there is, depending on um, your village impairment in terms of how bad that is, um, you can have someone meet you at reception and we can ask, you can ask for some support and they will take you, take you around or take you where you need to go. So if you went in for a swim, they could guide you and take you in there um, and let you in but it depends on what you need so I mean we look at everybody they sort of deal with everybody on a need um personal basis and what they need so it depends on to what support um you would need but if you were to tell them that then they would definitely provide that for you or if you had someone going in with you um again they get to, to use uh sites for free while they're they're supporting you um through the activity that you've chosen so they're all very welcoming in most of our sites so we've got sales contracts so we've got Dunstable, Houghton Regis, uh, Tinford, which is in Lake Buzzard, and then we've got Flittick, Saxon, and Sandy in the north. Um, so yeah, all very welcoming with the team, um, and obviously I'll be pushing it out after this as well, just to sort of say if some of you do um, want to come down, um, then let us know and we can, we can make that accommodation for you. So. Thank you, Lisa. The next question is also for you. Does the council offer any disability or visually impairment specific sessions? Uh, not currently in terms of our leisure centres, um, but that is something that I'm looking to, to do and engage with. So different um, ideas would be great. Uh, I know there's something called Goal Ball, which is quite inclusive, which I would look at to do in the hall. Um, it's also be swimming sessions. So it's Again, getting advice from yourselves really what is it you want to do and, and what we can do to put that on but we will be looking to engage more um with the sort of blind and visually impaired uh sector and community um but currently there's not any that i know of um practical sessions that go on at the moment but again like i said that's not to say that we we can't do it um and we will look forward to in the future fantastic thank you lisa next question for neil what can members expect at their first tennis session? Yeah, we would um, spend a little bit of time briefing, probably a bit like the park run. So just to sort of guide you around the club and to make sure you were kind of aware of how we got to the courts that we play on. Um, and I think we're always very keen to get everyone comfortable and to um, feel like they're sort of happy in their surroundings. And then I think largely really for us, it's, you know, jumping at the deep end, we'll um, get out on court, make sure we do a good warm up. Um, hopefully, as I was saying, if we have a few regular players, it's a really good to sort of buddy people up with existing players and they can share experience. But um, largely you're going to have a lot of fun um, and yeah, you're going to you enjoy yourself. But we'll just make sure initially that we're really safe in terms of where we are and how we get warmed up and then we'll just go for it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Neil. Now we will go over to the questions from the live chat. And to do this, I'll hand you over to our live chat operator, Mr. Ian Mitchell. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I think the panellists have been very, very uh, astute in, in answering a lot of the questions, but we've got one question that's come in from Anonymous, uh, and it's a question for Neil. And it's not directly to do with tennis, but I was just wondering if you know of any personal trainers or coaches who have experience in coaching people with VI? Yeah, um, so I don't, uh, I, I can't say that I do, but I do know quite a few people that work as personal trainers and work at gyms. So again, I, I think probably the best thing for, for me to do would be to have a chat with a few of my friends that are you know, working in that industry 
and then I perhaps can send um, a note off to uh, Masuma and, and maybe she could she could get in touch with whoever that was or put something out on some of your channels um, just to let you know. Because I think lots of what we found over the years is, you know, recommendations, word of mouth are, are often really, really important for people because you just want to build up a sort of trust with your coach or with the, the trainer. And if there are people out there, you know, local to me that, that have done some perhaps work with players with VI or blind people, then I think that's a really good starting point. Um, so yeah, I'll certainly do some digging for you and, and happy to help out. Thanks for that, Neil. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on uh, which side of the fence you are, that is the only question that's come in via the live chat so far. But there's still time if anybody wants to ask anything else. Well, another question I have for you, Neil, kind of, a, it's kind of a multi-level question, but it is more about future developments for the disability tennis program you know mm. are you looking at adding new features to the to the program and possible new equipment that you're looking at maybe to add to the range of equipment that you already provide for various players such as different balls or anything mm. and also are there any ideas of future different activities you are looking to introduce to your clients yeah good question um so in terms of of kind of balls and equipment um, you were saying, you know, just just a little while ago that the, the really the only balls that are made uh, for us really come from Japan and it's really actually difficult to get hold of them. And one of the things that we're really keen to do in our sessions is to make sure that we spend uh, more time playing and less time picking up. So um, we really need to get some more balls. We have a pretty big bucket of balls. It must be about sort of 30 or 40 sort of VI balls that we use. But actually what I'd really like to do is to get to the point where we maybe have 100, 150 balls. And then we just get a bit more of a run at, at doing some of the practices and, and have a bit more time within the practice before we then sort of stop and, and find ways to pick up. Um, when we do pick up, we do try and make it um, a bit more interesting and maybe sometimes a bit more fitness based. And we put some little challenges in around sort of hitting some different shots and collecting balls in a certain area. But I'd certainly like to get some more more VI balls for sure. Lots of the other equipment we use for uh, the other sessions that we run in our No Barriers program is is more sort of specific to what we'd normally expect to use for our, for our sort of across the board tennis program. So there's not a huge amount of specialist equipment required for, for some of the other sessions that we do, but certainly the VI balls are, are very sort of hard to come by and we'd like to build those up. Um, in terms of the sessions, we're actually pretty good at, at the tennis club and we do cover a real broad, uh, broad spectrum of, of sessions to really try and give everyone from the community a chance to sort of take part. What I'd really like to do over the next few years is to develop um, the work that we do with, with perhaps younger players and, and juniors uh, that might have a disability. And we, because we tend to found that our um, uptake for uh, sessions that we run is pretty good with sort of adults and sort of young adults, but actually for sort of juniors and perhaps those that are still at school, it's perhaps not something that we're as strong as. So I think in terms of the broad range of, of sessions that we run, we're, we're pretty good. We have, a, like I said, a, a lot of lot of different stuff that we do with all different disabilities. Um, but I think looking at some more work with the younger next generation, the next Huberts, I think that's really where we're after. Thank you for that, Neil. Um... I've had a couple of questions come in to me, so if I may come in, might just have time for one more before we have to get our next speaker on. Um, and this one's to Steve and Lisa. So the question is, what does a council see as the biggest challenge to making physical activity inclusive? You're going to go for Steve? <laughs> you can just run off, follow you. <laughs> Good question. Um, can you repeat it again, Masuma? please? Yes. Yeah, no, of course I can. So the question is, what does a council see as some of the biggest challenges to making physical activity more inclusive? Um, as I said, that's a very good question. Um, I, I come from a very sort of countryside background. So um, unlike Lisa, I'm, I'm not so much involved with the sort of more sporty or leisure, leisure centre side of it. But um, if I can just answer sort of personally from countryside, um, I would say, a big challenge is actually getting people to some of our sites. Um, what with cuts in, you know, cuts in travel, pu public transport. Um, I'm I'm very much aware that a lot of our sites are, for Bedfordshire, are quite remote, um, hard to get to, often no car parks. If you're lucky, places like Flitwick Wood 
which are pretty well surrounded by houses, um, that's fine because you can just walk um, to a site. But some other others, which are maybe you know a corner of a field or tucked away in a wood somewhere, are much harder. Um, and not only to get someone to the site, but to actually enable them to safely walk around the site as well is is, is you know is quite a challenge. Um, and it, it's bad enough with with you know people who are normally sighted. Um, but but adding the addition of um, um, VI people or blind people or people in wheelchairs or any other kind of disability, then it becomes much more of a challenge. But that doesn't mean that that we're not going to shy away from that challenge. And um, I think you know certainly my team and and I, I'm 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 pretty sure the wider council also are, are um, looking at ways to to challenge these um, limitations. I mean, for instance. As I mentioned earlier, we have a, um, um, a project, we've got some money, to, some funding to do, to get people into the countryside more, particularly people with um, disabilities. So, you know, and again, it's, it's another big but, but uh, we could do things like maybe lay on minibuses, for instance, to, to take people out for specific walks at particular places, um, which I think would be a great way to access some of our sites. And then shown around the site by someone such as myself or one of my colleagues. Um, so for, from my quite narrow perspective, that's probably our, our biggest thought and our biggest challenge, but it's one that we're going to crack. No, thank you for that. And I know the Bedfordshire Site Wealth Council are definitely looking forward to working with yourself and Lisa moving forward. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Hubert. Thank you, Masuma. So next, Thank you to everyone for the questions and to our guest panel for the responses. We will then now hand over to our guest speaker and final speaker for the evening, Roy Turnham, who himself is visually impaired and who will talk to us about his sporting journey. Over to you, Roy. Okay, good evening, Hubert. Evening, um, everyone on the panel and everybody who's um, watching and listening in. Um, it's great to have been invited here. So thanks so much um, for being for invited me to um, share my story. So um, yeah, my name's Roy Turnham. Um, I've been totally blind since birth. Um, I've got a condition which is inherited from my mum. She's very generous. She passed it on to myself, my older brother and my younger sister. Um, but she's equally generous in the amount of incredible support that we've received um, throughout our lives from both both my mum and my dad, who is also visually impaired. Um, they met when they were at college. And um, yeah, so quite an interesting family background there. Um, probably one good eye between the five of us. Um, and even that one, um, <laughs> my dad had to use a monocular to see when things were going. So yeah, holidays were interesting. Um, several suitcases, a guide dog, a retired guide dog, three young children on trains um, to go to various holiday destinations. Um, but the point was, is that as a family, um, we grew up in a very, despite the unusual situation of all being visually impaired, we actually grew up in a relatively kind of standard um, background. We all went through sort of mainstream education. It felt like a standard background to me. What I didn't realize was as a child was the sort of the behind the scenes things and all of the, the um, battles that my mum and dad had to fight to make sure that we got the same opportunities as, um, as everyone else, as our sighted peers. Um, something that I've learned more about as, um, as I've got older. So um, yeah, great great supportive background I would say um it's a great game to play talking of sports and activities when you're growing up and the three of you two brothers and a sister can't see at all hide and seek is generally a good game to play because you're never short of a place to hide um I used to stand on a table and just keep really quiet and, <laughs> and hope that nobody found me um but yeah we we, we, we grew up doing the same sorts of things as our sighted peers. The massive advantage we had, I would say, over many people who I've met who are visually impaired, who haven't had the same incredibly positive, particularly in sport, incredibly positive experience that myself, my sister and my brother have had, is that um, my parents had already been through 
um, sight loss. They, they, were, they competed in sports themselves. You know, we grew up with sound balls. Whatever sound balls were available, you know, we had them. I was playing football and cricket with them, with my older brother in the, in the back garden when I was, you know, from the age of three, four years old. Um, unfortunately, there was no tennis around, but we found ways of manufacturing tennis-like games. We used to, using the, um, using the cricket ball, we used to play a form of like, um, kind of like a, I guess like a volleyball, we used to we used to throw and bounce, catch and and create rallies through doing that. Um, and then we used to do stupid things like um, throwing a bouncy rubber ball that was meant for the dog that had a bell in it from the bottom of the stairs to the top, it flying back off the wall and then trying to catch it. You know, one of the things about being a, a child and getting into those sorts of things is you don't think about the uh, what can go wrong you don't consider the idea that it might actually come back and hit you in the face. So I developed those skills through, I guess, having no fear as well and um, learning to catch, learning to throw, learning to run and learning the, the um, what I'd class as the Holy Grail of um, particularly when you can't see at all, spatial awareness, actually being able to pick up when you're running around a sports hall or when you're running around a fenced, a fenced off area is actually, even though you can't see is being able to pick out the side, um, the, the, the fact that you're coming towards a wall and being able to pick it up running at pace, which became a very, very useful thing when I actually eventually got into, well, this is, well, I suppose I've got two first loves now, in terms of sports, um, football and tennis. Um, but the sport that I ended up going into com most competitively and re more recently professionally was, was blind football. And certainly those early experiences of being having the freedom to explore my environment and um, were, were a massive part of that for me. So um, the, the, the positive sides of things, that's, there's so many positives, but frustrating things so when I was growing up I loved football still do um and the, I was playing football though when I went into school it was very difficult to get involved in a competitive way um basically the ball that I used I would take in a, a ball with a sound the, but the other children quickly realized that for one um the ball didn't make a sound when it was in the air and for two I was quite short so playing the ball in the air was quite a good strategy. So I couldn't really, I couldn't really track the ball, particularly when there was a lot of people playing. Um, so competitive football for me, it was never felt like it was the only time it ever felt like it was fairly, fairly even, fairly fair was when I was playing with my older brother. But even then he was nine years older, that is nine years older than me. So um, it was still quite a challenge. Maybe that's why. I became so competitive growing up was because yeah I was always in that position where I was um kind of the underdog so to speak um but one thing that I was I would say probably my most the most important skill that I learned was not a physical skill and I do quite a lot of talks with um particularly with schools and children and making particularly when children are growing up Obviously, some people develop skills quicker than others um, and more sort of more naturally gifted at, at, at particularly physical skills. Um, however, I would say my biggest skill was the ability to practice over and over again. And one of the things that I would say to anyone, particularly if you're getting involved with a ball sport, is find a way of practicing in your home environment really important you know tennis for instance if you can get a ball and take it home and practice even if it's just bounce catching off a wall it could be kneeling down and bounce catching off a wall if you haven't got the space to kind of stand back and, and use a you know use a big room you know it's it's those things i really do think when you know when it was raining and we we weren't allowed to go outside you know, we did used to do that. I was saying about the ball, bouncing the ball up and down the stairs and praying that we didn't break any of the uh, the pictures on the wall. Um, so it was those sorts of things. And 
I was very, very, very determined. Um, and actually, the first sport that I got into competitively was a sport that I wasn't very good at. Um, and it's really interesting. It's been great listening to um, Kate talk so passionately about um, running um, because my first sport that I got involved in as, as a club was middle distance running. And I was at the back of the group. Um, I, I remember the first sessions, the interval sessions we were doing. I, I was doing every other interval because I wasn't fit enough to keep up with the group doing every single one. But what happened was I joined in the summer. It went round to the autumn months. And all of a sudden, about half the group disappeared because the weather went bad. And I continued to go along with um, the, the sort of more dedicated runners, rain or shine. I just kept going, plodding away, came around to the spring and then all of, a lot of the runners started coming back when the weather got better. And I literally went from the back of the group to being sort of in the, the front, you know, the, the, the front pack. I was I went from the start of having one guide runner who used to run with me all, all the time. I'm um, sorry. I went from the start of having different guide runners who would run with me at different points to then having a guide runner who was dedicated he he was really keen he wanted to run with me we were a team um because it was actually pushing him to run with me as well um and you know i was i i, I improved my 1500 meter time over a minute in one season just purely through enjoying the um the experience of going every week of getting better and um, not really worrying about people other people being faster than me but just wanting to see how far I could go and I, that was you know that obviously see making those improvements has gone with me into everything that I've done ever since when I was um moving on a bit further it's so I was in my early 20s um I was at a bit of a crossroads so I'd been involved in athletics I actually got selected for the um I was involved in the UK athletics development squad for a, a couple of years but I had some real troubles with injuries um turns out I had um hypermobility so over overly flexible joints in my feet which was stopping well were causing the impact of running to go through um wrong wrong joints basically and I was caused caused me all kinds of back problems and um it ended up I had to have surgery to fuse some of these joints together and um I came out of um my rehab after the surgery and um Basically, unfortunately, um, at that level of sport, you know, it's quite cutthroat at times. And um, I lost my um, funding, lost my position with the, the UK Athletics squad. But I, I was all I wanted to do at that point was just to get back into playing sport and playing a sport and enjoying playing sport and particularly the social element of it. You know, I, I met I met some of my best friends through playing sport. And it just happened at that time that Everton had entered a a team into the National Blind Football League. So I went and joined, uh, joined the sessions, um, really enjoyed it. Um, the coaches were very new to coaching blind football. Um, and actually, as, a, as somebody who'd been involved in sport for so long, I took it upon myself to try and support the coaches wherever I, I, I could um, and share my experiences. Um, because, you know, they they recognized that you know they they had a lot to learn and but I realized as well if I taught them what I knew they could then teach me what they knew as coaches they could apply their coaching skill to football to, to blind football and then um, we, we, we entered the team we entered into the um into the league and um my skills were pretty rusty because I'd done a lot of running but it was all in straight lines um, I'd not done a lot of actual technical stuff, but I impressed the England staff enough. I guess it was probably more my work rate than the fact that if I lost the ball, I would work hard to win it back. That kind of got me into their kind of um, as an interest to them. So I got invited to join the provisional squad for London 2012. So it was a provisional squad, much larger squad than the squad that was actually going to be chosen. Um, but I was in that position, obviously I'd 
I'd gone through it with running. I was used to coming from the back of the group and I thought, well, maybe I'm the least experienced player here. Maybe I'm, you know, seen as, you know, just somebody to make up the numbers to some degree. But we'll, well, I'm going to I'm going to push for, I'm going to push every single player in the squad. I'm, I'm going to train as hard as I possibly can. Um, a lot of that training was actually done on my own. Um, there was I, I knew that to be as good as I needed to be going to a club session once a week wasn't going to get me there. Um, I went down to my local sports centre. Um, unfortunately, they were closed during the day. Um, so they were locking up all the pitches. Um, so I, I used to climb over the fences into the pitch. Um, I used to go at like six o'clock in the morning because fortunately for me, I didn't need the floodlights. So um, I used to climb into the pitch, do about two hours of training. Then I'd go to university and then I'd go to the gym. And I was basically training as a full-time athlete, but without the funding, because that wasn't what it was about for me. It wasn't about the money. It was, it was about playing the sport. This was final, finally had the opportunity to play the sport that I'd loved since I was three or four years old, that I'd kind of gone through school being in that situation where I was always at a disadvantage. And now I was on a level playing field and I had a genuine opportunity to make it to the, um, to the Paralympics in 2012. And um, as it happened, um, the season before, I, um, I had a bit of a, a bit of a run of form. So I, I started scoring goals. I hadn't scored a single goal. Um, I'd been seen more as a defender. And then just the technical skills, all of the work I'd been putting in, it kind of started paying off. And I was um, second top goal scorer in the league. And I basically made it impossible for them not to pick me for London 2012. Um, and I was, it was just such an honour and such a privilege to be able to represent my country. But most importantly, it was such an, such a privilege to be able to represent my family, the family who, you know, who I'd grown up with, who'd basically laid the foundations for me to have the, this kind of resilience, to have this kind of independence and freedom to decide these are, this is what I want to do. And, um, and you know, my, my parents basically go to every single match that I, that I play and um, win or lose, you know, it's, they're, it's just it's just incredible to have that support. And um, London 2012, we actually we finished seventh. Um, at the time, we were the only team there who wasn't funded as full time athletes. So it was actually quite a good achievement to you know to get there and do as well as we did. And I actually made my first start for for England, uh, for Great Britain, first time I'd ever um, sang the national anthem as part of the starting lineup. So incredible memories. Moving on, um, so I've, I've been since 20, since 2013, we were off with those of us who were in the, um, the elite setup, we were offered central contracts. So th this was incredible for me because I went from, you know, climbing over fences into a, into a pitch to try and get a couple of extra hours training to suddenly being paid for playing football, you know, and the thing was, the, the best thing about it was I felt like I'd done it the right way you know it was a sport I loved I'd, I'd taken the opportunities that had been presented to me and I'd you know I felt very privileged to be in that position but what it also did was it gave me that extra boost I, I wanted to make sure that other people had the opportunities to um to do what I've done or well to at least try because that's the most important thing it's trying sports it's not everybody wants to go on and be an elite athlete and it's important that everybody gets to 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 do sport at whatever level they want to do and actually bizarrely I learned I found that in football for instance the opera it was very top heavy you know those of us who were playing at the top level we were the ones who were very who, you know who had the funding and we could play day in day out but there were so few local opportunities for people to play so I um helped set up the Merseyside Blind Football Club um, based in, in Liverpool, which is still running this, its 10-year anniversary of the club this year, which um, is fantastic. And we've managed to um, produce... When, we've managed to produce some um, players who've gone on to it to play in the England setup, But more, most importantly, we've got players playing for fun. 
is a, you know of, of all levels and that's the most important thing and moving on I'd, um i got into tennis when tennis um i moved to cambridge and fortunately for me i i did a google to see what local local um tennis clubs or well actually it was just local sports clubs to be honest for visually impaired people i was very fortunate to see that there was a um a club based in cambridge so i started um I started to play tennis and it things happened really quickly. I guess what helped me with tennis was the fact that I had a background in football and cricket. So tennis is like, it's a, it's an exercise in coordination. It's, it's an exercise of moving your feet quickly, moving your hands slowly and controlled to track a ball. So I'd played a lot of cricket growing up, but then I'd also played a lot of football. And I think all of those things together, plus, you know, I, I am quite um, quite determined and quite stubborn. So I, I used to book a squash court and um, practice for hour on end, just just hitting a ball against the wall so that I could, you know, I could work on my on my shots and my specific tennis skills. And um, it led me to a, I ended up winning the national um, the national title um, and then retaining it. Um, the next time I competed in the nationals. Um, so I was in a, I was in a position where I was competing for England in football, but I was also selected to play tennis for Great Britain. And it was, it was, um, it was quite a, quite a difficult position to be in quite, a, quite an amazing position to be in. But um, I just felt like I had to commit first and foremost to the football because well, for one thing, they, I was I was funded by the FA at the time, but um, I stepped away from football for a year just before COVID, and um, sadly, at that time, I'd then been selected for the the international that was meant to go ahead for the tennis in Italy, um, and obviously everything got cancelled. Um, but I think what it comes down to is some of the, the most amazing experiences I've had in my life have been through sport. And through um, going through local clubs, through trying things, I think that's a really important thing. There's, there's often, you know, understandably, particularly as we get older and we start to think about what can go wrong over what can go right, you know, because we're, we're aware of, um, you know, we, we are a little bit more aware of the safety aspects and that. And we're also aware of, you know, not wanting to sometimes worried about not fitting in or not being supported. Right. But quite often I, I know from my recent experiences of working as an activity coordinator for um, in the site lock loss sector, it's generally once people do manage to make that first step, they go from trying one activity to try it, to go into loads because that first step is often the hardest. And one of the things I would encourage anyone to do um, who's listening today is those opportunities that have been talked about by the rest of the panel is give them a try. You won't know until, until you, you won't know whether you're going to enjoy these things unless you actually go, are able to go down there and, and try them for yourself. And if it's not for you, at least then you know you've tried it. Um, but there's a lot more opportunities out there than you might think. So um, I feel like I've talked for long enough. So um, thanks so much, everybody, for listening. And um, I wish everybody the best of, of luck in whatever they decide to do. Thank you very much for that, Roy. That was really good. Uh, now I've got some questions. We also welcome questions through the Q&A chat function for Roy. But I'll start with some questions we have for you submitted by the attendees. The first question is... You've had various opportunities to try various sports. Which particular sport is your favourite? And which one you would suggest blind and partially sighted people to try? So, I mean, I, I, it's, it's going to be painful sitting on this fence, but I would definitely say try everything. Um, the skills, even if, even if it's not your favourite sport, the skills to be learned from every sport. It was like I was saying about the tennis before, I'd say football and cricket have helped me to become a better tennis player. Um, I think football, 
just about edges it above everything else. I think it was the the sport where, you know, I imagined myself playing for my favorite football team, you know, scoring scoring goals when I was when I was growing up. I think I think deep down, um, it is my it is is my absolute favorite sport, but there's plenty of others that are a close second. Thank you for that. Next question we have is what importance does sports hold for you in your life? I did, there's so many areas. Um, so, you know, I, I've met so many great friends who are, you know, to this day, still, still some of my closest friends through playing sport. Um, it's the confidence um, that transfers into everything else that, that you do in life. Um, it's things like some of the things that you, you don't necessarily think about straight away but being a good footballer or being a good tennis player requires you to be good good at balancing and being having good spatial awareness and an awareness of your 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 body and those things are quite crucial in a day-to-day situation you know we all do it as well I'm sure sighted people do it as well where you misjudge a curb for instance you stumble on a curb um someone is looking at their phone and barges shoulder barges you whilst you you're trying to go for a for a, um you know you're going shopping or whatever having those sporting skills the core stability element the balance they're crucial in your in your day-to-day life you know as opposed to tripping over and falling when you stumble on that curb you can write yourself because you've worked on those those kind of balance and agility skills so all different areas, really, very transferable into everything. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what advice would you give to a person who wanted to try VI sports but doesn't know where to start? So I would I would start with um, looking at local local areas, look at what's look at what's around you, local centers. Um, but then I would also go if, if you've got use of the Internet, you know, I was the same when I moved to Cambridge, I just Googled because I, I didn't know I'd barely even visited the place, to be honest. <laughs> I'd only visited there to, to look at renting houses. Um, so I didn't know anything about the local area. And I, I just went on. I just Googled um, like sporting opportunities in in Cambridge. And I appreciate not everybody has um, has the Internet. Um, I think it's it's really important. And that this is a challenge for for everybody, for those who are you know, the providers as well is to, to, to reach out to sighted, uh, visually impaired people in different formats as well. It's really important on the radio, get, get you, you know, if you're providing something, get it on local radio. A lot of visually impaired people do listen to, to radio stations, even, you know, even if they don't get on, you know, they don't have the internet. So it's, it's, you know, if you find, if you finding connections really, wherever you can. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Roy. Have we got any questions in the chat for Roy, Ian? No, I think Roy's uh, exhausted everyone there with his experience. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Roy? It's good to see you. Pal. Yeah, you you too. You too. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I, I didn't meet. Have I sent everyone to sleep? No. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think no. you were very, not, Roy. You it's a very interesting talk. Roy, I have a cup couple of questions for you um that i've received if yeah. you're happy to answer and yeah. i can definitely testify to roy's determination and stubbornness to succeed <laughs> um so what are the questions if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self what would it be that's a that's a really good question um and i would say um looking back um going from casual sport to competitive sport came in quite a rush and I almost like became too strict with myself and I think the thing I would say to my younger my younger self is or whether you're on a journey and you're you know you're you're determined to make the best of yourself bring everybody else around you on that journey you know you might be looking forward um at what you want to achieve next week next month next year but look to the side as well and and bring those others around you because because you can be you can end up being quite driven and quite selfish when you're a, you know when you are driven as a sports person 
but those people around you are, are just as important and you have to support them as well. So I would just remind my younger self of that, I think. Excellent, thank you for that, Roy. And one other kind of follow-up question. So you know, you sort of spoken about the support network and how that plays such an important part. Do you feel that if your, your parents weren't so sporty, that your kind of journey may have been different? Or do you just think you were naturally drawn to sports? Um, I think that, um, I don't think it was just that my parents were sporty. I think they were very, because they never, they never sort of pushed me into sport. I, I, I got into music in a big way and, and still am as a, as a musician. And they, the thing that they did was anything that I expressed an interest in, they kind of made sure that it was, it was supported, providing it was obviously legal. <laughs> and um you know so I, I I get the impression with my parents that any I mean I, I I my first instrument for instance was a clarinet and I think my mum enjoyed the clarinet because she likes classical music but then I took up drums and she used to have to put up with me and my band rehearsing and probably sounded like a load of equipment falling down the stairs as opposed to anything musical for the first couple of years but they they saw how much you know how much I was getting out of it so I think I think that support is crucial and I am and it, again it's this thing I, I always you know remind myself of how privileged I've been to have such a support network because many people I know many people don't um and, but it is important to remember that even if you haven't received that support there is support out there you might just have to look a little bit further afield sometimes absolutely thank you are there any other questions for Roy if not Hubert I'll hand back over to you uh, Masuma can I ask uh, Roy a question it's just Neil absolutely go for it Neil. Hi. Yeah. hi Roy it's really uh, amazing to hear your story it seems like you've been pretty pretty busy and uh, picked up really well over the sports that you've done. You kind of briefly mentioned it, I think, in your reflection about what you might have said to your younger self. But I'm always fascinated with um, people, particularly in sport, about what you would say that sport has taught you about life and what life has taught you about sport. So I think life has taught me that winning isn't everything in sport. Um, I unfortunately was it lost was on the wrong end of a penalty shootout in 2015, which meant we missed out on our qualification to Rio. And at the time, it felt like the, the worst thing in the world. And then life reminds you that other things are more are always more important. As long as you can still go back to the people that you love, and as long as you can still um, enjoy enjoy living because it's it's such an a you know it's such a rare thing to you know for us all really to be in a position that we can we can have you know full full lives you know I, I, I think that's that's something I've learned you know life has taught me um I think sport has taught me um to reflect a lot I think sometimes in in life we can get frustrated about things and sport has given me I'm not a very organ naturally very organized person and sport has taught me to be organized and to sort of or better organized in some ways um, because of the structure of it and because of um, you know asking myself questions why didn't I get that right this time what what do I need to do next time to get it better and I think that transfers into life massively you're amazing uh, thanks very much thank you oh, no thanks for the question cheers Excellent. Thank you, Roy, and thank you for joining us this evening um, and, and speaking with us about your journey and answering the questions from the panel. A uh, pleasure, and um, best of luck with all the, you know, with the um, the activities. And um, I, yeah, I hope it all I hope it all goes really well for everyone. Um, you, so Roy. yeah, thanks for having me. Welcome. So that actually brings us to the end of the webinar. So thank you to everybody for attending, and. 
hopefully everyone will agree that it's been extremely informative and it's been fantastic to hear from our guest panel and answering the questions. So thank you to all of our guest panel and I hope everybody has a good evening and we look forward to meeting you at a future Bedfordshire Sight Loss Council forum. Thank you. Good evening all. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.